again for the privilege to come into your house and to worship you, to praise you, and to bring the word that you've given us in your church. I pray for your anointing. I pray for our ears that they would be opened and our eyes that we would see. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to speak to you this morning on the subject, God shut off the faucet. God shut off the faucet. In Genesis chapter 8 and verse 1, the Bible says, And God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters are swashed. That's the King James Version. In the ESV Version, it says this, but God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind blow over the earth and the waters subsided. In the HCSV version, it says this, God remembered Noah as well as all the wildlife and all the livestock that were with him in the ark. And God caused a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters began to subside. I want you to notice in all three verses, the word wind is mentioned. In the Genesis 8 and 1, the wind passed over. In Genesis 8 1, in the SV version, the Bible says the wind blow, blow over the earth. And in the HCSV version, it said the wind passed over the earth. People get a little confused when it says, and God remembered Noah. People say, well, did God forget him in the boat? No. Noah was in a holding period for one year in that boat with his family and with God. And if you go, go back to Genesis chapter 7 and verse 1, God said to come into the ark, which implied that the presence of the Lord was in there. Amen. Come in. When you ask someone to come in, you're already in there. When you ask someone who knocks on your door to come into your house, you're already there. That's right. So when God said to Noah and his family, come into the ark, it was the first invitation given by God for man. God's presence, it's implied, was there. So people say, well, what does it mean when the Bible says that God remembered Noah? He was not forgotten by God. God didn't forget Noah. He recalled, he thought about Noah constantly. It was brought to his mind. God was getting Noah ready for the next phase of this experience of being in the ark. God was remembering because he said, now I have to do something different. The boat is really moving. It's a violent rain, and we'll explain that in a moment. And the Bible says that the word assuage, which means to subside or decrease. Always remember this, floods which I equal to trials, don't recede all at once. You have to get this. Floods don't recede all at once. But the word assuage in Hebrew means to fail, to halt, to come to an end, to terminate, to calm down, and alleviate. It actually means that the flood will eventually be put to rest. It's important. When we experience trials and tribulations, when God says it's enough, listen closely. When God says it's enough, he will send a wind to blow over and pass over our lives because the Bible declares in Psalm 34, 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous. Yes, but, B-U-T, the Lord delivereth him out of them all. Amen. Numerous afflictions and trials and tribulations. There's numerous afflictions and floods in our life. And what are afflictions? Bad things that happen sometimes. Things that are disagreeable. Things that are malignant. Things that are unpleasant. Things that give us pain, unhappiness, or misery, or distress, or adversity. This is what this means. But God says we don't have to stay there. God says the flood will subside. It will go down. 
But if you notice in all the trials and tribulations you've been in, different trials and different tribulations have different time periods, just like a flood in the earth. A flood might happen in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and it's going to be a number of days or weeks before the water subsides, as opposed to a flood possibly in upstate New York. Different time periods. And it's so important to identify the flood in your life and the time period and not give up until the waters completely subside and the earth becomes dry. Mm -hmm. When did God remember Noah is a very good question. When did he remember him? When he was in a flood. The Bible says in Psalm 29 and 10, the Lord sitteth upon the flood. Yea, the Lord sitteth king forever. What does the word say? The Lord sits where? He sits upon the flood. He sits on it. Listen closely. And the Lord will give strength unto his people, and the Lord will bless his people with peace. Do you know what the word sitteth mean on the flood means in Hebrew? It means to dwell, to remain, and to abide, to sit on it. What God is saying is this. God is in it with you. Oh, the enemy comes and he says, oh, God forgot you. God don't care about you. God's neglecting you. Listen carefully. The Bible says, The Lord sitteth upon the flood, yea, the Lord sitteth king forever, and the Lord will give strength unto his people. The word strength means to exchange or provide. And sometimes when we're in a trial or a flood or a tribulation, we get fearful and afraid, and we become anxious and doubtful. But God says, I want to exchange that for something else. My peace. My strength. And his strength is what? His power, his might, and his boldness. It means that we can become strong and prevail even in our flood. So many people are giving up. So many are saying they're tired. So many are not allowing God to exchange their tiredness and their weariness. And their sadness and their anxiety or whatever for the peace of God, which means sound, praise God, which means to be in a covenant of peace and quiet, a place of tranquility, a place of contentment. And the word peace in this verse means to be finished or to make an end of. Every trial has an end. Look back in your life. Look back in some of the worst moments of your living. You're not there. You're not there. It ended. Oh, yes. Okay, Pastor, but then there was another trial. Of course. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Let's be realistic about life. It's not tiptoeing through the tulips here. Life is tough. Life is hard. That's why Paul told young Timothy to endure hardness as a good soldier of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's tough being a Christian sometimes. People say, well, my life was easier when I was in sin. Of course it was. Nobody was bothering you because the devil already had you. As soon as you signed up with the Lord, it was on. The devil came. He said, I don't like this. I don't like you going to church. I don't like you carrying a Bible. I I liked you better when you were out there. And you said, no, I I don't want to do that. You made a choice. And the fight and the war began, praise God. Look what the Bible says. Sometimes we think God forgets us during our trials. Look what the psalmist said in Psalm 13 and 1. How long wilt thou forget me, O Lord, forever? How long will I hide thy face from me? Do we actually think God's going to forget us? You know what that word forget means? It means to neglect. You think God's neglecting us? A lot of people think that. Well, where is God? Where is God? He's still the same yesterday, today, and forever. God did not reveal to Noah how long he was going to be in the ark. And sometimes God doesn't reveal to you how long you're going to be in the trial. God did not reveal to Noah when he would be released from the ark. (laughs) Noah's faith was tested. And our faith will be tested in these last days. Make no mistake about it. This is a war. That's why the Bible tells us in Proverbs 3, 5, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding and all thy ways acknowledge him and he, he shall direct thy paths. Nothing's changed. You didn't just get here. You just weren't just thrown in a seat here. 
you've come through a progression and a process in your life where God has brought you through. Amen. There's a thread in your life if you look back in your life. There's a thread there. And God pulled you through. He put a rope on you. And he remembered you because he's in covenant with you. And he sits with you in every trial and tribulation that you're experiencing. The Bible says in Proverbs 16 and 3, Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. People's thoughts are out there. People's thoughts aren't biblical. People's thoughts aren't on the promises of God. It's what they're going to do to us. That's right. What they can do. And we're forgetting what God can do. Right. No, no. Don't forget what God can do. In a moment of a twinkling of an eye, God changes anything He wants. Amen. He changes it. And God is always on time. Amen. He's a God of the prophetic. Yes. He lines it all up, my friend. Come on, look in the Bible so many times. Yeah. How can Isaiah the prophet prophesy that Jesus would come and be born of a, through a virgin and 700 years before the birth of Christ? And then it happens. How? Because God is a God of the prophetic. Amen. Now I want to bring a verse to you. See if this doesn't resonate in the Christian church today. Philippians 2.13 and 14. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Whether you're in a trial or not. It's still the same. For it is God which worketh in you. He's working in you. Even during hard times. Both to do what? To will and to do of his good pleasure. Now look at verse 14. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. Now we have to stop here for a moment. Because the word murmurings in Greek means obviously to murmur. But listen closely. It means to mutter, to grumble, to say anything against in a low tone. Hmm. You ever have a situation where the person and they mutter in something, you say, what did you say? Who's that? It, right. it wasn't a compliment. No. <laughs> this word murmurings means a secret debate. It means a secret displeasure not openly avowed of those who discontently complain. It's a grudging. Now look at the word disputings. This is imagination. You know, sometimes we let our imaginations run wild. Oh, God doesn't care. Where is God when I need him? Why did God make this happen? This word disputings means doubting. It means the thinking of a man deliberating with himself. It's inward reasoning. A deliberating, but listen to this now, questioning about what is true. It's a hesitation and an arguing. People silently having controversy with and mad at God. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe this is existing today in many, many lives of people. They're mad. They're angry with God. Because it's not going the way they want. This isn't working out. My home, my marriage, my kids, my job. Complaining, murmuring, disputing. Listen to people when they talk. Listen to the negativity. Listen to how everything is just a downer. It's too cold, it's too hot, it's too much rain, it's too much snow, it's too much this, it's too much that. The world, the sky is falling. I'm never going to get out of this. You will. We, we will get out of this one of these days for sure. But we will get out because the Bible says, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of all of them. So what are we going to believe? The word of God? Or are we going to believe the lies that want to come to us and make an agreement with us that God doesn't care, that God forgets us? Listen, God knew exactly where Noah was. He knew exactly what was going on, and he knows exactly what's going on in the earth. Listen, wind is very important in the, in the word of God. Wind is very important in the way God does things. Look at Exodus 14, 21. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon dry ground, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left hand. This was the wind of God that came through. And then in Exodus 14, 27, 
When they were on the other side, Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to his strength when the morning appeared. And the Egyptians fled against it. And the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. And the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the host of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. There remained not so much as one of them. God triumphed over the enemy that was abusing the Jewish people. And God will do that again. I say God will do that again. People need to be really careful because they don't know the word of God. And the word of God still holds true in their life. When you don't act right toward a a child of God, you're going to get the wrath of God eventually in your life, in this world or in the next. When? In Luke chapter 8, verse 22. It came to pass on a certain day that Jesus went into a ship with his disciples and he said unto them, Let us go over unto the other side of the lake. And they launched forth. Important word, launched. But as they sailed, he fell asleep. And there came down a storm of wind on the lake. Did you not think that Jesus knew there was going to be a storm that day on the lake? He's sleeping in the boat. And they were filled with water and were in jeopardy. (laughs) And verse 24, and they came to him and awoke him saying, Master, Master. When you you hear two two words back to back, they're in panic mode. We perish. (laughs) And then he arose And he rebuked the wind and the raging of the water. And they ceased and there was a calm. Praise God. And he said unto them, where is your faith? And they being afraid wondered, saying one to another, what matter of man is this? For he commanded even the winds and the water and they obey him. Yeah, just like the psalmist said, Lord, how long are you going to forget us? These disciples were in a boat with Jesus, and as soon as they saw the semblance of a trial and tribulation, the wind was coming and the water was filling up the boat, right away they thought Jesus didn't care. Where is he? He's right there. He's in your boat. Come on, pinch him. He'll say, ouch. He's right there. And so do you think he's moved out of your life? You think he's gone on vacation? You you think he's taking a sabbatical from the world and say, you know what, world? You take over for a while. It's not God. He's in the flood. He's in our midst right now. Praise God, wind. Look what it says in the the book of Acts chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly, praise God, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing, mighty wind. There's the wind of God. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. And sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. We need the wind of God to blow in our churches once again. We need the wind of blah, the wind of God to blow from east to west in our nation. And from west to east and north to south and south to north. We need the wind of God. Praise God. One more praise. God outpouring of God's Holy Spirit. One more awakening in America. People are already giving up. Not praying. Not believing. Not going to church. Come on. God is still God. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. He knows exactly what's going on in this world. He knows exactly what's going on in every country. Praise the Lord. Let's look at Genesis 8-2 now. Look what it says. I want to talk to you, and this is important, about the progress and the process during a trial. In Genesis 8-2 it says this, And the fountains also of the deep and the windows of heaven were stopped, and the rain from heaven was restrained. And the waters returned off the earth continually, important word, And after the end of 150 days, the waters were abated. And the ark rested in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, upon the mountains of Aria. Now I want to look at the word continually. 
What does the word say here? And the waters returned off the earth continually. It means the waters were now departing. They, they were moving. They were, they were going away. And this word gives the impression that one is coming forth from the trial little by little and departing from the worst part of the trial. It gives the impression of progress. <clears throat> Do you understand what God is saying here? This is a very important point. Because the waters return from off the earth continually, which means they were moving, moving away, going down, abating, subsiding, and so on, giving the impression that they were coming forth through their trial. Genesis chapter 8, verse 2, in the message version, it says this, the underground springs were shut off. Water was coming from two different directions. The water was coming from heaven, and the water was coming from beneath the earth. The underground springs were shut off, and the windows of heaven closed, and the rain quit. But look what happened. Verse 3. Inch by inch, the water lowered. And after 150 days, the worst was over. On the 17th day of the seventh month, the ship landed on Ariat mountain range. What was God saying here? Water was coming from the top and the bottom of the earth. That's right. Some theologians describe this water and this rain as a violent rain. Just think, you're in a boat for one year with your family and a bunch of animals that you're taking care of. And this violent rain is hitting that boat. It rained for 40 days and 40 nights. But you're in that water. You have no idea where you're going. You have no idea how long you're going to be in that boat. I can't imagine the conversation inside that boat. Just like you can't imagine some of the conversation that people have in their homes when they're going through a trial and a tribulation and a flood. Come on now. <laughs> what kind of conversation do we have? God don't care. Where is God? What's the use? What's the point? I can't take no more. I want to run away. <laughs> Even David said that. Oh, that I had wings as a dove that I would fly away. We all get to that point sometimes. But we can't stay there. We can't stay there. Listen to what the word of God is saying. The boat was moving for quite a long time. Like a car or, or a plane trip. You know, when the kid's in the back seat, are we there yet? And you just pulled out of the driveway. Are we there yet, Dad? Honey, we, we didn't get out of the driveway yet. When you arrive or land, you're just as happy not to be moving. The Bible says that the, it, they rested. The Bible is, is saying what? The, the, the word of God, okay, is, is saying that they are now in a place of rest or settling down and remaining. When you go through a trial, as, when that trial hits you initially, it's like the end of the world. It's like, oh my, this is a blind side. I, I, I can't believe this is happening. And then as you wait a little bit, as the days go on or weeks go on, the initial impact of that trial begins to subside. And you begin to get your composure. You begin to get yourself together. You repose. You, you begin to rest in your spirit. You, you begin to say to yourself, I have to settle down. I have to remain in my faith, praise God. Not fighting the situation because I'm obviously in a flood. I'm obviously in a trial. And when the Bible says they rested and landed on Mount Ariat in, in, in verse 4 of eight, two, eight of uh, chapter 8, the word Ariat means the curse reversed. That's what the word Ariat means. It means God is in the process of reversing the trial. Amen. He's in the process of reversing what the enemy has thrown against you. Ariat means the curse reverse. Hey, listen, God is very smart. He knows exactly where to send us. And he knows exactly what everything means. Praise God, because he's God. We just have to extrapolate it from the Bible and interpret it for our personal lives, praise God, and for our nation. The boat's in a flood. There's no doubt. Our nation is in a flood. There's no doubt. You have to be sick not to know that. But the boat's moving. And I know the boat is moving because there's millions of Christians that are still believing and still praying and still loving God no matter what. No matter what the flood, no matter what the trial, no matter what the tribulation. And God is in the process and is able to do and overturn the curse 
and reverse it. Look what it says in verse 5. Grieve, but believe in hope for tomorrow. Listen carefully. This is the progression and the process of a trial. In verse number 5, and the waters decreased continually. There's that word continually. Until the 10th month. And in the 10th month, on the first day of the month, were the mountain tops of the mountains seen. Now this is a, a, a very enlightening verse. Because when you look at the word decreased continually, the word decreased means to be lacking in strength. You know when you go through a trial or a tribulation, you fight really hard and make yourself believe this is not happening. And you use all the strength and might that you have in your being to push against it and pray it away and claim it and name it and put it under your feet and put it in the prayer box and tell people to pray for you. You're going in your own strength. This is what this word decrease means, to be lacking. Don't go in your own strength. But the Bible says that this word in Hebrew means to, to bereave. It means to grieve. During a trial, which I'm calling a flood, you finally sit down and you finally rest and then allow yourself to grieve over the situation. It's okay to cry. It's okay to break down. It's okay to have emotion. It's all right to cry and let out all the emotion that has built up during this flood especially since the initial impact of what's come against you. Hear what God's saying? God is saying, slow down. Stop going in your own strength because look at the words that the waters decrease continually. And the word continually means this, to walk again, to have vision and hope for tomorrow and every day thereafter. Amen. It means healing for your soul and your spirit. But pastor, you don't understand what I'm going through. I'm trying to tell you the progression and the process of a trial. If you listen to what the man of God says this morning through Amen. the Lord. Analyze your trial. Analyze when it first started. Man, you got madder than a hornet's nest. And you did everything in your power to fix it. I'm going to fix this. I got a plan. And you used all your strength to implement that plan and you failed. Until you got to the place where you sat down and you said, you know what? I can't take this anymore. And that was good. Because now you're resting from your own strength and now you're saying to God, I need some help. Amen. If you're smart, you're saying that. Yep. And the word continually here means to walk again. God is saying, do you hear what I'm saying this morning to you? You're going to get up because you know how I know that? Because you've come through many grievous trials in the past in your life. And you're still sitting here. And God brought you through every one of those. A, B, C, D, E. All the way through the alphabet sometimes. Oh, and you didn't die. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, yeah, thank you, Lord. You might have had a financial setback, family setback, health setback. You're still here. You're still kicking. You're still praising. You're still worshiping. You're still singing. You're still believing. Amen. So why should we think now that God has forgotten us and it's over because you have no idea what I'm going through? Look what the word says here. It says, the water decreased continually. And then what? Then they saw were the tops of the mountain seen. You know what that means in Hebrew? It means light at the end of the tunnel. To have vision and hope for tomorrow and every day thereafter. To have healing for your soul. They were saying, you know what? God was trying to tell Noah this. He was trying to speak to his spirit and say, hey, don't worry, son. I've got this. And you will see the tops of the mountains. You will walk again out of this boat and you will get out of this flood. Mm. You know, we've all been knocked down. That's why I love what the word says in Proverbs 24, 16. For a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again. But the wicked shall fall into mischief. Same verse in message version. It says, no matter how many times you trip them up, 
God loyal people don't stay down long. Soon they're up on their feet. Loyal people to God don't quit. And we're not quitters. We're still in the game. I said, we're still in the game. The world's counting us out. The world's saying, you're done. What are you talking about? We're just starting. You have no idea. We're just starting. And when prayer goes up, the spiritual bombs come down. So be careful. All throughout the Bible. They said, you're done. You're done. You're done. Oh, really? When Jesus died on the cross, the people said, we're done. Let's go home. Have a hamburger and a fry because we're going to be arrested next. Jesus walked through the wall and he said, oh, ye of little faith. As they were munching on their Big Mac. He said, I told you to meet me in Galilee for lunch. Where were you guys? I've been sitting at the deli all this time. Where have you been? It's not over, boys. As a matter of fact, it's just the end. Just start. That's right. Have a prayer meeting. Come on. Go to the upper room when I leave. And you'll see something happen that you've never experienced before. Oh, come on. That's what God is saying. Have a prayer meeting. God is saying, let's assemble. God's saying, let the wind blow in your life one more time. I'll bring you out of this flood. I see you in the boat. I see you in the ark. I see you in the flood. Praise God. I'm coming for you. So what happened in that boat? Look at Genesis 8 and 6. And it came to pass at the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made. What? You know what the word open means? It means to break forth and let loose. It means to be free. It means to, it's time to live again. That's right. You know what God is saying? Open your window and get some fresh air. That's right. Exactly. Breathe in. <laughs> open your window and get some fresh air. Air out all areas of your life with the breath of God. Breathe again. I remember when we got sick as kids and we were at home. My mother would open up all the windows in the dead of winter. Yep. You say, Ma, what are you doing? Fridge out. It's freezing. Kill all them germs. Get rid of the it's germs. fresh air. <laughs> Sit down, Sonny. <laughs> That's right. Your mother knows what she's doing. Some dicks yeah. on your chest. I tell you, that wind will blow through that house. That's right. It did blow right through that house. You think your mother was out of her mind or something? Fresh air. Fresh air. Breathe. We're going to live. We're going to come through this. Because I'm not having you stay home from school more than two days. We're going back to school. You pay taxes for a reason. Get back. Yeah. And you know when you were sick in our house when you were young? You didn't walk around and play. You were in bed all day. That's right. You didn't come out of your room. Talk about quarantine. That was quarantine. Real, real deal. And if you were faking it, <laughs> you lost out. And the next day, you miraculously got healed. I feel good, man. Oh, come on. How many of you woke up early in the morning and you didn't want to go to school and you went, <clears throat> I think I have a sore throat, Mom. <clears throat> Mom says, okay, go to bed. See you tomorrow. Because if you're sick, you don't feel like eating. No, no food. <laughs> you don't feel like eating. I'll give you some water near your bed. You didn't have no fruity medicine. But go out in the cupboards. Pants. See you tomorrow. Boy, <laughs> miraculously, the next morning, I feel great, Mom. Can I go to school? You begged your mother to go to school. They didn't bring you toys. They didn't entertain you. They gave you a book. Read. Read. This is school. Got schoolwork. Catch up on your homework. Study hall. Mm. Oh, my kids couldn't wait to go back to school. Now it's just the opposite. I don't want to go to school. I don't want to go to school. Please don't send me to school. College students, please don't send me to school. I don't want to go back to school. I might get germs. You can get germs anyway. 
Put your mask on. Put three on if you want. Learn something. Put ten on. Go to school. Get some discipline. Praise God. Hallelujah. Now look what verse 7 says. So what does Noah do? He sends forth a raven which went forth to and fro until the waters were dried up on the earth. He sends out a, a raven which is a selfish bird. And you know what the raven represents? The world. And it went to and fro indicating no sensible direction. That's like a lot of people who lose their mind in a trial. They lose their minds. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? The first thing we're going to do is sit down and take a break. Get a cup of tea or get a cup of coffee. Get a cookie. Sit down. Let's talk. Because if we panic, you're going to be out there on the lake somewhere and then we we'll have to call the police and the fire department with a big net. And we don't want to do that. So calm down. We'll get through this. Hear what I just said? We will get through this. We have to come together, folks. Amen. Because we're all going to experience some pain, some different situations, and so on. Praise God. What, what does Daniel say in Daniel 12 and 4? But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the end of time. Many shall run to and fro. That's what's happening. People are running back and forth, back and forth. What, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Well, the first thing we're going to do is go back to basics and go back to the Word of God. Go back to church. Sit in the house of God. Get under someone that's going to preach the word of God to you. The raven represents the world, but then look what happened. And verse number 8. Also he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters were abated from off the face of the, of the ground. But the dove found no rest for the sole of her foot, and she returned unto him into the ark, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. Then he put forth his hand and took her, took the dove, and pulled the dove back into the ark. What does the dove represent? The dove represents the Holy Spirit. The dove represents peace and tranquility. The dove finds no rest in this world. Hmm. Listen carefully. You think you want to go home to Jesus? There's a Holy Spirit in you that wants to go back. Come on, listen to what God is saying here this morning. The dove desires to return home also, my friend. Noah then put forth his hand and took the dove and pulled it back into the ark. Know what God is saying? Get a hold of the Holy Spirit. Keep the Holy Spirit close to your heart. It implies a willingness to receive. Hold it in your hand. Amen. Hold it tight. Hold it to your bosom. Because you're going to need the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is the comfort of God in the last day. It's the comfort. Look what happened in verse 10. And he stayed yet another seven days. And again he sent forth the dove out of the ark. Notice the seventh day interval. It represents the Sabbath day. What do you do on the Sabbath day? You rest. What did Noah do? He sent out the dove once again. And what happened to the dove? In verse 11. And the dove came into him in the evening, and lo, in, in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off. So Noah knew that the waters were abated from off the earth. And he stayed yet another seven days, and sent forth the dove, which returned not again unto him anymore. It was a sign that things were changing out there. That's right. It was a sign. And if you look at your trial and your tribulation, you'll see signs. You'll get a word. You'll get a revelation. Someone will pray. Someone will contact you. Someone will give you hope. Someone will instill vision in your spirit. These are signs. The Holy Spirit coming to us, bringing us. Praise God. What did the Holy Spirit bring back? He brought back in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off. God wants to bring us an olive leaf. He wants to bring us wisdom and knowledge. And sometimes it comes through other people. That's right. Don't close the door to fellowship. Don't close the door to communion with people. Don't close the door. Leave it open. Because even out of the mouth of babes, God will give you wisdom and knowledge. In your deepest moment, in your deepest trial. Praise God. Look what it says in the, the Bible. Verse 13, 
And it came to pass in the 600th and first year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dry up from off the earth. And Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. Progression. Process. And in the second month, on the seventh and twentieth day of the month, the earth dried. Do you see what's going on here? How did we start? It was a deluge from the top and from the bottom. A violent rain, a violent storm. One year in the boat. And finally, he's resting on Mount Ariat, and the waters of the earth dry. What does the Bible say in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28? Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And you shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Don't go in your own strength. Don't go in your strength. Go in the strength of God. Mark 6.31 says this, And he said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart unto a desert place, and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. You know, sometimes you got to get in your car and go for a drive. Sometimes you got to go to the next town to find a diner or a cafe and have your nice meal. Hear, hear what I'm saying? You got to change the pace sometimes. Because yeah. if you just stay in that mode, you're going to die in that mode because it's a mode of negativity. The enemy is trying to just bring to you. Get a different menu. Jesus says, come apart. The flood is still there. It'll be there when you get back home. The trap. But you know what will happen? You'll get a different perspective. Something will inspire you. A good meal, an onion ring, praise God, with a hamburger. <laughs> Isn't that good? Yeah. Hear what I'm saying? And you'll get back home and you'll say, you know what? We're going to come through this. And you start talking to each other, or to yourself, or to God. I know you haven't left me. Follow me here for a few more minutes, can you? Yeah. What is God saying through these scriptures? Let's look at the progression of the flood. I've kind of summarized it here. It was a deluge, a flood, and a violent rain that covered the earth. Eight people were secluded and isolated in a boat that took many years to build. For one year, this family lived in the boat, not knowing where it was headed. But God knew exactly where it was going. In verse 1, the water subsided. In verse 2, the water lowered even more. In verse 3, inch by inch, the water lowered. After 159 days, the Bible says the worst was over. In verse 4, they land on Mount Ariat. In verse 5, the water kept going down until the 10th month. In verse 13, the waters dried up. In verse 14, on the 27th day of the second month, the earth was completely dry. Progression and process during a flood, during a trial or a tribulation. So what is the conclusion here? The waters or trial subsided in progression, which was a process that they had to experience as God was directing the ark and directing the progression of the decreasing waters. In control of the water. He's in control of the wind. Look what it says here. Look, look what the Lord gave me here. The same holds true for our lives no matter what trial we are experiencing. God is directing the progression of our flood, which is equal to the trial, and it will eventually subside and decrease and dry up according to His will. Here's what the enemy is telling me it'll never change. This will always be. There's no way out. We're cooked. We're done. It's checkmate. <laughs> Wait a minute. Where's the word of God in our lives, folks? It's not checkmate against us. It's checkmate against the enemy. Read the whole book. Amen. <laughs> well, here's what God's saying. The, the whole progression is a process of learning 
okay, to be patient until we see the conclusion of the trial. Here's what happens. A trial happens, a flood comes, and a little while after it comes, people throw their hands up and say, I can't do this now. I'm out of here. I quit. I'm going to take my game and I'm going to go home. I'm not playing with you no more. And they're talking to God because they're disputing and murmuring against God. They got that quiet stuff going on, that, that tone, that anger. I'm mad at you. You know I am. God says, yeah, I know you are. <laughs> I know you. But I got you. And if you just trust me, I'll bring you through. This is what God is trying to say to us. In the meantime, we must all do all that we're expected of us spiritually so we can come to the other side. You know what Jesus said in that storm? He said in Luke 8.22, Now it came to pass on a certain day that he went into a ship with his disciples and he said unto them, Let us go over, praise God, unto the other side and of the lake. And what does the Bible say? And they launched forth. Important word. Give me a few more moments. You know what the word launched means? It means in the midst of and through all that's going on, let us launch forth, which means to loose, to sail, to depart. It means God is saying, hey, you're not tied up to the dock. Amen. Cut the shoreline. Cut the rope. Cut the rope. You're not tied up in this flood. I've got it. The word launched means, okay, let's depart from where we are, praise God. And the word means to lead or bring into a higher place. I know you can't see that sometimes when you're in the midst of a great trial or tribulation. You just can't see God bringing you to a higher place. But that's what the word launched means in Greek. That God wants to always bring us to a higher place. Well, folks, we're not done. Well, we are just not done. There's a lot of rungs to the ladder that God wants us to climb, guys. Come on, listen to what the pastor's saying this morning to the Lord. This is not done. There's more songs, there's more preaching, there's more teaching, there's more souls to, to, to win to the Lord. There's more children to raise up in Christ. Come on, we're not done. Amen. Are you with me here? Amen. We're not done. Let me exemplify. God told Moses to stop crying. I'm going to prove it to you. And give this message of hope to the people. Because they're in a panic. Oh, look what it says in Exodus 14 and 5. And it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled. And the heart of Pharaoh and of his servants was turned against the people. And they said, why have we done this? That we have let Israel go from serving us. And he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. And he took 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt. Not just the 600. Those were the choice, the choice ones. He took all the chariots and took the people with him. And he took 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of Israel and the captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and he pursued after the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out, praise God, with a high hand. They couldn't see it. Okay. They're on the other side of the Red Sea. A day before they were probably wanting to drown Moses. Can we go back to Egypt? Can we have a, a wonderful menu of onions, leeks, and garlics? Come on, ghosts. And it wasn't that bad. This is what people said. It wasn't that bad. It wasn't that bad. Are you serious? Want to walk around with bad breath the rest of your life? Are you serious? Nobody wants to live with you. You got garlic breath, man. Who wants to be around you? Once in a while, it's okay. We're all going to eat garlic pizza. Okay, fine. Make a pack. We all eat garlic pizzas. We all have bad breath. Man, every day. It's a little much to take. It's like dirty socks. Never changing your socks. After a while, walking those socks for a few days, it's going to smell down there. There's no air conditioning. That's what the word says. Listen, the children of Israel went out with a high hand, but the Egyptians pursued after them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army 
and overtook them encamping by the sea beside Philaroth and before Beelzephon. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel, now they're on the other side, listen. They're on the other side of the water. They lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them and were so afraid. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Imagine having a pack of those people in your church as your parishioners. <laughs> we're going to die. Hold it. Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? You like to get beat? You like to be abused? C come on, people. <laughs> for it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians that we should die in the wilderness. Are you serious, people? And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you to this day. For the Egyptians who you have seen today, you shall see them again no more forever. A prophetic utterance from the mouth of Moses. Amen. You think they believe that? God divides the water. They walk over a dry ground. The wind came through. They're on the other side. And they look behind. That's what people do. Turn around. They're gonna get us. Turn around. We're gonna get us. They, come. they get closer. Don't matter how close they get. Listen to what the word says. Look, look what God said. The Moses said, stand still. And then he said in verse 14, the Lord shall fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. And look what the Lord says to Moses. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Stop crying, Moses. Stop. That's what a lot of people do. Because the crying is murmuring and disputing. I don't like this, God. I don't like the cards that you dealt me. I just don't like it. God is saying, just hold on here for a moment. He says, Wherefore criest thou unto me, Moses, speak unto the children of Israel, listen to what it says. And this is the word for the church and for the Christian church in America. Thou tell them that they go forward. Go forward. But lift up thou thy rod and stretch out thine hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. Do you know what happened? When Moses was on the other side of that Red Sea and praise God, those waters came back down upon the Egyptians. Every one of them drowned. But what did the people want? During the flood... Instead of watching the progression of the trial and the process of what God was trying to bring them through, they panicked. Let's go back to Egypt. I'm out of here. I quit. I can't do this no more. Well, if you want to be a coward, go. God's not stopping nobody. You want to quit on your marriage? Quit on your home? You want to quit on life? That's your choice. That's what God's saying. Quit crying to me. Make a decision. Don't keep bringing it back to me. Because you're just crying. Instead of doing what I'm telling you to do, and this is what God, is, I believe, is, is saying to the church, fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you to you today. Praise God. What is God saying? I will fight for you. I will rescue you. I will come for you. So, to close, what is the conclusion and where do we go from here? The key word for me right now is let us launch out and go forward. Believing that God is in control and monitoring the progression of our lives, we are a work in progress and we are a work in process. You have to understand what God is saying here this morning. Whatever you're going through, there's a progression. And the waters will not drown you because he, Isaiah the prophet told us and the fire will not burn us. We will come out. We will get to the other side of the lake. Somehow. God always has ways and means to bring forth his church in glorious victory. 
and glorious victory. He's a man of war. And he has never lost a fight. He's victorious. Let us pray. Father, you've, you've brought a word to us. And Lord, I look at it as the anatomy of a trial or a flood. The progression, the process. And I see, Lord, how you brought Noah through and how the waters subsided little by little. And eventually the earth was dry. Father, sometimes it looks like the waters are drowning us. And it seems like, Lord, sometimes in our homes, we're in our boat, seemingly all by ourselves. Thinking, you don't care, people don't care, and what's the use? But the truth of the man of God is you've always cared. Because if you didn't, you would not have gone out through the power of the Holy Spirit to find us, to bring us to Jesus. You do care. And you care presently. And Lord, all, all I can see this morning as I close this sermon, I, I see Stephen being martyred and being stoned. And he looks up to heaven. And instead of Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father, Jesus is standing. And Lord, I believe that you are standing this morning in my spirit. You're standing for the people in China that are being abused and persecuted and tortured. You're standing for those in India, in different countries, in the Middle East. You're standing for children that are being trafficked, Lord, throughout the earth for immoral purposes. You're standing. You're crying out with arms outstretched, wanting and willing to help those that call upon you. Father, we're in a fight, and you know that better than we are. But God, you brought Noah through a great, great period of time of a flood from above and from beneath, turbulent waters, violent rains. And Lord, maybe this last year we've gone through Turbulent waters, trials and tribulations. So many are just giving up and saying, what's the use? You can't fight City Hall. You know what? God's in control of City Hall. God's in control of government. And the prophet said in the Old Testament that the government shall be upon his shoulders. Thank you, God. That the government shall be upon his shoulders. There will be justice. Lord, you will balance out the scales. You will show, O oh God, that you are a great king and Lord of lords. And you will show people who is in control of this world. Not man, not a political system, not an economic system, not a religious system, but you are the king of kings and the Lord of lords. You will not forget your people. The Egyptians might be to our back and the mountains to either side and the Red Sea before us. But like in days of old, God, if we would dare raise our rod, praise God that you have put it in each of our hands and declare victory in the name of Jesus Christ, we will walk over on dry ground. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you and thank you for listening.